Vietnam, you would also come over here. Oh, very easy at that. Hello everyone for joining. This is Esther Roxy and we are going to begin our next talk, which is by Dr. Priya Dachshund. She is joining us from the Blue Marble Space Institute, where she is a research scientist. And she is going to talk about the stuff that we don't see so much often. About aliens, but a different type of aliens, which may be so small, we cannot even see from our eyes. So, good evening, uh, Dr. Priya. and uh, we're happy to have you here namaskar mera naam priya da sharma hai main america mein rehti hu aur main yahan par kaam karti hu so i will share my screen with you and i'm so excited to have so many lovely students here and uh, look forward to your questions at the end uh, i will share my screen now one second so there we go so uh, there we go so The question that I was asked to answer was, 
uh, can extreme microbes on Earth be space travelers? And that's a question that I've had in my mind since I was very little, because I imagine we're not alone in space. I, I really think we might not be alone. But on Earth, there are lots of places which seem like they're from another planet. And I work on microbes with Professor Shiletto da Sharma, who's my husband, and we work together on Halo Archaea. And you can see that they're absolutely beautiful. You can see these ones. Uh, there are many, many places on Earth that seem like they could be on another planet, places that are hypersaline, which means really salty, or that are very hot, like in uh, there where water is actually boiling, cold, uh, the places with a lot of pressure, there's places with a lot of acidity or alkalinity, and some places don't even have any oxygen. So there are organisms that are found in all of these environments. The ones that we work on live in this extreme salt. So we have two model microbes uh, that we work with, and one is called Halobacterium species NRC1. That's my favorite one. Um, that was the first of this kind of organism sequence ever in this world, and was sequenced by our laboratory. And the other one is one that I worked on the genome for, and that comes from a deep lake. It's called Halorubrum lacus profundi. It comes from a deep lake in Antarctica. So it's really super cold. Now, it's a very hot day probably where you are and where I am, uh, and you can't imagine how cold it is, but it does get really, really cold, but the lake doesn't freeze. And why is that? It's because of the salt. The salt prevents it from freezing. It actually changes the temperature at which the liquid freezes. So on, you can see down here, the microbes from Great Salt Lake, uh, so from San Francisco Bay, NRC species, uh, Halobacterium species NRC1. Um, actually, they, you can find them in the wild. You can see this was a picture I took from an airplane flying over the, the salterns. And then here they are in the lab and they actually float. So they're really cool. And the ones from Antarctica don't. They're beautiful, but they don't float. So that's why NRC1 is my favorite. So this is again, the, uh, the San Francisco Bay. And you can see that they're all different kinds of these microbes. So there are purple ones and red ones and orange ones. And so basically we're looking at the salty side of life. This was an article that we wrote for American scientists a time ago. And you might actually enjoy reading this because it talks a lot more about it. They're also found in places like Great Salt Lake. If you guys remember the Olympics happened there and they're also used for art. They're called eco art. And you can see down here, this is an artist who did sort of with stones in the lake and made this sort of design. It's quite pretty, isn't it? So my husband took this from the uh, shores of Great Salt Lake and it's actually the natural color. It's also found in places like in the high, uh, um, areas of Bolivia and Salar de Uni, we actually isolated microbes from this. This looks like you're on a totally different planet, right? So you can imagine, you walk here, you think there's nothing there, but then you dig a little bit down, and our colleague Daniel was there, he dug up, and you can see that there are layers of things in here, and we actually were able to isolate microbes from their brand new microbes. We've also got them in the lab, and they survive inside salt crystals. And that's pretty amazing. If you think about it, if you needed to travel through space, how would you do it? You could sit on top of something, you'd probably get dehydrated and radiated by UV light and super, super cold. But if you're enclosed inside of a salt crystal like these guys, you're basically protected. You're kind of, you know, suspended animation kind of thing and we can travel around. So these are absolutely beautiful, aren't they? So they, that's how they can survive and they can survive inside. So like I said, in these brine pockets, inside here, see that? And so how can they do that? We don't know exactly. We've been studying this organism for 30, 40 years in our laboratory, and we still don't know exactly why, but one thing that's super interesting, I think, is that we've looked at their genomes and their proteins that they make and found that they're different from any other organisms on this planet that have been discovered so far in that the, almost all their proteins are acidic, which is kind of an interesting, uh, I don't know if you guys, can you see this? Can you see the whole um, um, graph here? So you can see yes, they're, yes. they're completely acidic, whereas almost all other organisms, they have a peak in two places. They have acidic and they have basic and a lot of stuff in between and our organisms don't. And that's been true from the first halo archaean that we sequenced all the way to, we've done more than a dozen since, they've all been that way. They're really weird and they're really super strong. So uh, our major newspaper here, newspaper here in the U.S. is called the Washington Post, and they actually call them superbugs. And we think that they're superbugs too, in a good way. So there they are again. 
And recently, I'll tell you about something that we have just been working on, is isolating these microbes from 250 million year old salt. So not only can they survive traveling in this weird way through the salt crystals, but they can survive for millions of years down below underground. We actually took the took the travel down into this mine shaft. This is a miner and he was showing us the salt on the walls and we actually got to take some of that back to the laboratory to isolate microbes. So you can do time travel and uh, space travel with them. Another place where you might want to test out microbes like these, which is kind of why we want to say, can they actually travel through this uh, situation? is to send them up to the place that's closest to being like Mars-like conditions. And that's the stratosphere. And some of you, maybe the older ones of you, you learned that they're layers of the atmosphere. So the troposphere is what's close to us. And then the next layer up is the stratosphere. And then there's a mesosphere and there are multiple layers above that. The stratosphere is just about like in Mars, except there's no surface, right? Because it's just up in, in sort of in the air. And that's actually where the jet planes fly. And this is a picture that uh, our son took of San Francisco Bay and you can see there's an airplane flying down below you can see earth this is our microbes that we uh, sent up into the stratosphere you can see earth down below and this was a project that we did with some students in California and they were a little bit older than you you can see that there but there they were they took these weather balloons put our microbes onto a platform you can see them there and sent them up into the stratosphere where they were exposed to ultraviolet light, they were dealing with ozone, they were as cold as minus 65 degrees Celsius, which is hard to imagine, and low levels of oxygen, and it was dry up there. So that we sent them up in little tiny vials up into the space, and guess what? When they sent them back to us, we were able to grow them and they grew, which is pretty amazing because all the other experiments that were ever have ever been done on microbes being sent up into the stratosphere they dried them down and made them non-active. And those of you who are a little bit older will know that UV damage, ultraviolet light damage, happens to cells that are dividing, not to cells that are dormant. So, and these cells don't form spores. So we took up the two model microbes I told you about, the ones from San Francisco Bay, that's kind of hot. It's almost like, you know, maybe the way the weather is with you now. And we took up the Lacus profundi, the one from Deep Lake in Antarctica. And guess who survived better? Well, it was the one from Deep Lake. Guess why? Probably because it was cold and it's adapted to that. Plus it forms this thing, these are the microbes, and it forms this thing called biofilms that sort of is a, maybe serving as a protective, uh, protective uh, sort of system for it. And here they are in the flask, you can see they formed a biofilm on the flask itself. So they're pretty cool, literally, if you know what I mean, the pun. So we're saying that these microbes could possibly survive on Mars. So even if they don't exist there, if we wanted to bring them there as a beginning of a food chain, we could probably do that because brine shrimp eat these microbes. Fish eat brine shrimp and we could eat the fish. I'm a vegetarian, but you know, if I had to, I don't know. If I was living on Mars, I probably would eat just about anything because there's not much there. So they can survive these cold. So we this is the stratosphere and the Mars. If you compare the two, they're pretty much you know, similar conditions. So they could potentially survive the travel back and forth. We were at a NASA conference recently about Mars extant life, and they were looking for what was next. And they were talking about places where possibly life could be found in all these different places. And there's salt deposits all over Mars. They've actually mapped them, which I didn't actually include in this talk. So can they get transferred between Earth and Mars? Well, I don't know, <laughs> possibly. Uh, some of the Martian meteorites that have landed on Earth um, actually contain salt. So possibly if they're enclosed in those little enclosures in the salt crystals, they could be coming. And guess what? There are three main groups of Martian meteorites that are categorized. And the number one one are the Shergotites. And they actually are from Shergati in Bihar, India. It was like a five kilogram uh, meteorite that fell there. And somebody had heard that there was noises. They watched it fall. And that's actually it was found in 1865 from India. So that's pretty cool, I thought. And they're thought to be uh, about a billion years old. That's 10 to the ninth years, really old meteorites. So the other thing I wanted to tell you about that's pretty cool about these microbes is we have purple ones, as you can see right here. Um, and so the thought is that we could look for life on other planets, on extrasolar planets or elsewhere, 
Um, yeah, if you had such a great telescope, you could look in through a microscope, you could see the microbes. But if you can't, you could look for what are called biosignatures, which are the way sort of um, the colors and, and or some kind of signal that says that there's life there. And we can say, yeah, green for chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a very, very, very complicated molecule. Our microbes actually do something else. So here they are, they're, they're the cells. You can see the colonies of the cells there. Um, and uh, Professor Dasharma, in whose lab I work, um, has got what's called the purple earth hypothesis. And that says that these organisms have what are called retinal-based phototrophy. You can learn about that a little bit later. There's a molecule down there, um, which arose early in evolution on earth. And so that impacted the development of photosynthesis and created life for the search, uh, sort of implications for the uh, search of life beyond our planet. So it's based on this molecule. It's ancient and simple, and it does basically what chlorophyll does. Um, it converts sunlight energy into chemical energy using this uh, purple membrane, which is basically on the surface of it. And he studied that when he was working with Professor Hargobin Krana, who actually cracked the genetic code and won the Nobel Prize. Uh, so when my husband was at MIT, that's, that's what he worked on. And we're still quite fascinated by it. This is a lake um, from Australia um, that we got from Cheatham Salt. And you can see that the color is there, the purple. So there is purple on this earth already, but maybe that's the way our life was more simple, more um, less complex early on in earth. And maybe this is the case uh, out in uh, planets right now, if they're in that stage of development. And you can learn more about this. If you look for PBS eons, there's a uh, YouTube on that. So can you work with these guys? Absolutely. We have a whole bunch of teaching modules and kits and whatnot about that. Um, you can go ahead and grow them. You can do experiments on them. You can sort of dry them down to salt crystals, see if they resuspend. There's lots of stuff you can do with that. This was a cover that we had recently um, on the American Biology Teacher. And you can see this is Great Salt Lake in Utah. Uh, the one I was telling you about before, and you can see there's a causeway that divides the lake into two. One side is less salty and the other side is more salty. You can see the red one, the pink one. That is actually um, uh, where our microbes are growing. And this was taken by uh, astronauts on the space station. And they were wondering, they actually sent down a message wondering what was wrong with them. Why were they looking at a lake that was two different colors? Well, that's because of the causeway that's split in two. Uh, you can also learn more about Halo Archaea um, at our website. It's uh, https halo-ed.org. Halo and there's lots of information and resources there. You can even explore their genomes and proteomes on there. We can, we can give you access to that. You can learn more about molecular genetics and how these organisms might adapt um, on our tutorial there. We actually uh, give out certificates when students have done the test for that. And that's what I had. I was told it was supposed to be a short talk. So this was my short talk. If you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Priya, for that wonderful presentation. And before I move on to taking the questions from the student, the first thing uh, that caught my eye was definitely the color um, that these microbes have. Mm. So we don't see um, like, you know, the organisms which are so big, they have different colors on their body, whether it's a plant, it's an animal, it's a fish. But what about is these microbes that all of them have the same shade? They, they all come in different colors. So these are different pigments that they have, right? So they, they, it's what they have that they're using for their uh, system. So yeah, they come in all these different colors. And um, so in, in a way, when you say you can't see them, no, you can't see individual cells, but you can see yeah. the, the cultures of them. So, and, and you can see them from space. So <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. And now I will be taking the uh, questions. Uh, so uh, can you like stop sharing the screen sure. um, so that we can have your screen on a little bit quick? Sure. Yes, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, questions we have definitely is like you had previously pointed out that we can take these uh, microbes to Mars and they can survive there. And they can even, uh, you know, survive there. And when we bring them back to Earth in the atmosphere, they can again survive there. Um, so when uh, can such an experiment be conducted? Like, I think it has been already conducted in the space. Uh, but what about it? When can it be conducted on Mars or Venus in one of the future missions? Well, there's a whole field called planetary protection. Um, so the idea is that, you know, we're going to protect the planets that we go and visit not only, you know, we protect them from us and our microbes and our life, and we should protect ourselves from them. 
So there's a whole, there's a, a lot of debate there. And you know, on our planet, unfortunately, right now, we're not really very much in harmony. But the idea was that in space, everybody should be unified and there should be a unified approach to it. And unfortunately, that's sort of disassembling as well. So depending upon who brings what, where, I don't think that there are, um, it's hard to control, right? Because even if you think your spaceship is clean and you think, oh, I'm going to put lots of UV radiation, IR radiation on it, and we'll kill all the organisms on the outside of our spaceship, uh, our microbes can survive that. <laughs> so when, you know, the standard organism is considered, well, okay, that's if we kill all the E. coli on there, yeah, but you might still be transporting our microbes to Mars. I don't know. Um, I'm not a planetary protection person. Um, I do think that eventually, if you're going to have life on Mars, if we're going to settle there, if that's something that's a goal, you have to have the food chain, food web start somewhere. Um, and you need to sort of, and you need water and you, you, there's a lot of things and there is water on Mars. So you, you could potentially put it together. I don't know the time frame because I don't think that they know yet. And then we're going to be bringing back, there's a Mars mission to bring back samples. So once they figure out what's there, maybe then they will decide after that saying, okay, yeah, there are, there is life or there is not life there. If there's no life there, then maybe you could say, we're going to make a planet and create it with our organisms. Um, but if there's life there, you got to sort of take that into account. You probably read in your textbooks about Australia and places like that where they've Im imported organisms to control other organisms and then their problems, right? Because there's no natural predators. So you want to be really, really careful about these things. But I'm not a planetary protectionist. Yes, yes, definitely. So it's it's not something that can be um, the the experiment can be just uh, conducted out so simply. A lot of thought has to be put behind it how can it uh, damage the place that we want to go to and how can the microbes from that place which we might have not detected can damage the life that we have here on earth mm -hmm. um, so when uh, we talk about aliens so we always have these uh, like you know giant uh, looking creatures or maybe very similar to earth but recently i realized that if we are trying to find aliens or the evidence of alien life anywhere um, the most probable thing is obviously going to be um, something which is microbial life, life which is simple, maybe not so intelligent. Um, so when you think about like whenever we might have the first uh, evidence or, you know, first proof coming that there is an alien life which can be present. So which is that place in our solar system uh, where you think this might be a huge, huge possibility is just that we have to send another mission there. Unfortunately, you're asking somebody who's a microbiologist, so I have a very focused pr perspective on it. I, I just want to say one thing first about the term intelligent. Uh, I think that honestly, these microbes can do everything they need to live in a single cell and they can survive all these conditions. Pretty smart, I think. I think maybe smarter than most of us. Oh, you know, if we go outside on a really hot day, you know, we want the punka there, we want to have, you know, like, you know, thumbs up or something yeah. like that, I, you know. Who's intelligent? Who's the one? The one who's making war? The one who's just dividing and just living in there? So I think uh, intelligence, I think is, I don't know which planet. I, the reason we're sort of focused on Mars is because that is a, a known planet where there's a possibility that we could potentially, you know, find something it's sort of been focused on it. I know that there's all sorts of other ventures out to other planets. Uh, people are thinking about Venus and people are thinking about extrasolar planets. There's a sweet zone. Uh, I'm not an expert again, sorry. <laughs> Yes, so uh, a student Bhavya is asking the halo archaea that we have, can it survive in uh, normal water as well that we drink? Oh, good question. Uh, I should have mentioned halo means salt in Greek and archaea meaning ancient. And people think that they're ancient and they, they require high salt. And you remember the picture that we had about the Great Salt Lake. The side that, that was blue is actually saltier than seawater and that will kill these microbes. That's the only thing that these microbes really are very sensitive to is dilution. So they need really high concentrations, like 4.3 molar salt, for those of you who are doing chemistry, it's very high salt concentrations. Water will kill them. Like pure drinking water, it'll kill them. They'll, they literally burst open. If I had time, I would show you a video of it. You can actually watch in like 30 seconds, they burst open and die. That. So it's they like they will survive radiation, they will survive all desiccation, all these things. But water is dead. I mean, like pure water. They're in water, but it's very, very, very salty water. It's not even the kind you do with a gargle when you, you know, have a sore throat. Not that kind of salt, even saltier than that. 
Yes, yes. Um, that's exciting to know that even though these are so strong, maybe um, you know the extreme conditions for them could be what is natural for us, and what is mm-hmm. natural for us and extreme for them, those things can be interchanged. Uh, Guys, Achilles' heel is what they say about that. You know, it's like the one point in a you know. You know. Yes. So we have one more question, and this is um, so a student is asking: Are the microbes man-made or are they natural? So it's totally like, natural. Total, totally natural. We have the capability in our laboratory, and because we sequence the genome, we have all the methods that are available to doing research in E. coli. Like we can express proteins in it. We're using it for vaccine development. Actually, the things that make them float are called gas vesicles. We are using it for vaccine development, so we can manipulate them in the laboratory. Uh, we can express things to actually. We're working have a system uh, to fight sepsis using these microbes. Um, they cause no diseases. And we can, you can, you can. If anybody's ever eaten Thai food, the Thai fish sauce. Actually, I don't. Again, I'm a vegetarian. Don't eat it. But, but that actually is made, and you can actually isolate these hyaluronychia from it because they use them. They actually break down the nutrients in there, so that you can eat them. So, but they're not the ones that you were seeing. They're all natural. There's no Photoshop on that. There's no colorizing of it. They are literally. That's what they are. They're natural, and they're found all over the world. Um, and deep in mines and you know all the way up to the high andes so there's there's amazing pretty much anywhere you look uh himalayan um pink salt if you guys ever heard of that or the salt lamps you can isolate them from there so uh, i think that man made no no so they're they're natural and they can be found in almost any place um yeah. so there was like one more question uh like where can these microbes uh be found as in like if somebody wants to see them what are all the places where uh, microbes are present because we cannot see them with their eyes uh well I, you guys are welcome to uh i will put my email in the chat um okay. or, uh you're welcome to contact me and i can give you the map of where we have isolated them from and actually you can find out on our website um there we go Uh, so you can, if you contact me or you go to our Haloed website, they're found literally all over the world, from you know, top to bottom, left to right on the planet. I mean, everywhere. So, uh, it, it, but where it has to be really, really salty, and pretty much every place has it. I think a lot of cities in in the U.S. have it underground. They have actually salt uh, fields where they've actually been harvesting salt from um, any uh, uh, salty lake. Places where they make salt. Um, we are not exactly sure how they get from one place to the other because we were able to find our the NRC one type organism from uh, so it came from San Francisco Bay, right? Um, and then we found it from that from the Salar de Uni. We also found it in you know mine salt. So we're not sure how it's all over the place. The same type of organism. It's not exactly the same organism, but very very similar. So how did they get from one place to the other? It's obviously not being transported by water because we know they would have died. How are they getting there? By little salt crystals floating in the air? Well, there was some Japanese studies on bacillus, which is a different type of organism, but it being transported by sandstorms uh, and little particles. I don't know how our organism gets from one place to the other, but you could pretty much, if you search, you'll probably find them if there's enough salt. Yes, yes. And like, what if um, a student, you know, has a beaker of salt, and uh, if they are trying to do such an experiment? Um, you know, they have normal water and salt water, and they have microbes in both, and they're trying to do some experiments. So, will it be able to present anything that we can see from our eyes, or is it only possible that we're going to see whatever is happening underneath using a okay. microscope? Okay, I'm going to reassure all the moms and dads who are listening that table salt that you're eating is not going to give you any microbes, probably because they probably heat them, and they basically heat will also. I mean, like you can. Destroy them. So most salt like that. Kala nimuk. I tried to get some growth from it. I have not yet gone very far with it. Some of the salts are raw salt. So there, there's salts that like if you get like sea salt from there's some sort of like specialty salts where they haven't processed it. But the white salt that you have on your table, no, you're not going to be able to. Most likely, you're not going to be able if you grow something from that. Be a little bit worried. Um, but most likely, you're not going to be able to. It needs to be raw salt. So it's okay. the salt that you've gotten from a natural environment. They need some nutrients. So You would need to have some of that. A lot of that information is in our modules, teaching modules, mm-hmm. and I'm happy to help. It like if a teacher wants to do this with their, I would definitely do this with a teacher 
don't do this mm -hmm. at home. This is not a home experiment. This is a school experiment or laboratory experiment. But yes, we've been able to isolate them from various sources. And so basically you can grow it. And like, like I, you saw in the pictures, what you'll grow is something beautiful. Probably. Yes, yes. I've isolated some that are kind of meh, they're kind of like a beige-ish color. And, you know, I tend to be, go, okay, I'm not really that interested. I like the colorful ones, but I have grown them. So we have one strain that is, um, uh, that is just an off-white color. And so they, there are some that don't have a beautiful pigmentation. But I think that one was from a salt mine, 250 million years old, never saw salt, I mean, sunlight in how many years, right? So maybe it lost the capability of doing it. So it's possible that that one, it was just a mutant, in which case it doesn't. But I think that if you do grow it, and I have um, 20 new samples from these salt crystals, from the one that I told you, the, the mine, um, and they're all in the color range so you should be able to see something growing in it and then if you look under the microscope you can see all different shapes so some of them are triangles which is crazy can you imagine a micro that's like shaped like a triangle or square or round which is kind of what you'd imagine them to be or rods and some of them form clusters they're all different kinds I mean, you can see i'm a microbiologist but the triangles that's wild what yes, else in yes. nature is, is triangle shaped right can you think of any yeah. organism that's triangle shaped aliens right yeah, yeah, def definitely. And uh, that also uh, brings me to one of the questions uh, that I, I think one of the last questions uh, where Bhavya Joshi is asking, what is the structure of microbes? Because I think now after you've mentioned triangles, they, they can be anything from the outside. Um, but how do they look like from inside? Inside. Okay, so some of you have learned about the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Pro means before and the carrot has to do with the nucleus so those are those are the microbes that we're looking at so we're looking at archaea which are considered to be the ancient ones um and then there are u bacteria or true bacteria which are like e coli and a lot of the things which i mean e coli is in our gut so they're, they're not at all bad but there are a lot of those kinds of microbes so and the other kinds of organisms are the eukaryotes and those are the ones like you and me and fungi and plants and things like that they have a true nucleus so, and they have lots of different organelles inside of them. So those are those are one category. Our organisms don't have that kind of structure. So their DNA is sort of floating around inside of the cells. So you can imagine there's something on the outside, the outer layer, and then inside is where all the chemistry and biology goes on. And the only organelles that you see, and these organ organisms are kind of different because most teachers will tell you there are no organelles in prokaryotes, but ours do. Ours just love to be different. Um, they form these little gas vesicles. So these are little protein sacs that help them float and, and actually was discovered by, by our laboratory uh, originally. And we actually sequenced all of those genes and we've been working on That's what we're using for the vaccines. So they're, they're really, really hollow. And how that works, we don't know. And there are very few things in nature that just naturally float. So they can float up and down in the surface. So that, again, we've been studying that for years, still don't have an answer. And I'll tell you one little secret as a scientist. What we are doing is research. We're not doing search and find, and we're done. Checklist, multiple choice, no. It's search, research, research. Again and again and again. And in the end, we may still, I mean, I get, I'm old. I may be done with my career, may still not have an answer, but I answered a lot of questions along the way. So it's research. So remember, if anybody wants to be a scientist, be patient, be diligent, listen to your teachers, focus on it, and you will progress and do reading, lots of reading. That's very, very, very important. Yes, yes. Um, we have just uh, one quick question. Uh, like, do they don't have as many cells as we humans have, the microbes? They're single-celled organisms. Just well, one cell. cell. Yeah, there's some organisms that where there's a, like, male and female, like in humans, and so E. coli does that. Our organism is just a single cell, and then when it gets older, it just divides into two. So in a way, they're almost immortal. If you think about it, they just, all they do is divide, right? And they can, so long as there's food there and they haven't actually, you know, they, they take in food, right? And out comes bad stuff. Like, you know, mm -hmm. what bad yes. stuff comes out of people. And so, um, so they can grow until it's, it's, they've used up the nutrients or until they've made it a dirty nest, so to say. Um, yeah. But if you keep, keep the flow of the nutrients and everything going, they can keep dividing forever. So they're probably also immortal except for the water remember yes 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 um so all the students who had joined us and asked these uh very very uh, invoking questions about the microbes and uh, how they are connected to us and maybe 
also related to finding things which are outside the earth a link between us and aliens um and i want to thank dr priya sharma for being a part of our event on such a short notice and uh, i loved so much about microbiology from your presentation and how beautiful these things look like even Absolutely. from outside and next so. time i'll show you how it looks when they dry and when they burst open so yes all right for that for that we will bring uh, dr priya once again so do let us know in the chat uh, if you want to have another session with dr priya um thank you so much ma'am for joining us um and uh, yeah have a good day ahead yes sir. thank you bye 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 thank you bye. Hello everyone. We have our next speaker who is Dr. Lauren Saylor joining us for the third session of the Alien Week 2022.
And now we are going to learn a little bit more about the microbial life which is found in the oceans from the astrobiologist. And you can ask your questions after the presentation is over. So you can ask all of your questions in the YouTube chat and I will be asking them to Dr. Lauren in just a short while. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Lauren Seiler. I'm a professor, assistant professor at Stockton University in Southern New Jersey. So I'm coming to you live from the beautiful Pine Barrens in New Jersey. Um, for me, it's morning, for you, it's evening. So good evening to you, good morning to me. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about life in the ocean and how we can study life in the ocean to help us find life on distant worlds. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about water and the amazing properties of water, why it's so vital to life, and some of the habitats on Earth that may be representative of habitats on other worlds. Uh, and so I'm going to share some slides with you just to get us started. All right, so. As I mentioned before, life needs water. And this is something that we're all kind of fundamentally aware of, right? One of the main things that a living thing needs is water. Why is this? Well, water is a molecule with really interesting properties. It's composed of oxygen and hydrogen, and the oxygen atoms and the hydrogen atoms carry a partial charge. It's a polar molecule. Because of this, water can act as a universal solvent. It can dissolve many of the molecules that are important to life. It helps move these molecules from place to place. It also helps give living cells their shape. It helps to buffer against um, extreme changes in pH. Uh, it actually, because of this uh, partial positive and negative charge, water molecules like to hang out together. Uh, they like to line up so that these positive and negative charges can attract each other. And this gives water this cohesive property that um, helps it move uh, in the way that it does and flow in the way that it does, but also helps it to hold heat and regulate temperature. So water can hold heat and um, keep places warm for life to exist. Uh, it can help maintain body temperature for living things. And it also is a direct uh, participant in many of the chemical reactions in living cells. Water is also a reactant. It reacts with things and uh, makes biological molecules. And so the importance of water really can't be overstated. And because of this, the search for life in the universe is really the search for water. While we may envision uh, other types of life that depend on other solvents apart from water, it's really difficult to uh, conceive of a type of living organism that doesn't need water in order to exist. But more importantly, the search for life is the search for liquid water. Water uh, in this context has to be as a liquid. It can't be frozen and it can't be so hot that it's steam. So we have to find an environment where water can exist as a liquid. So in order for us to determine whether liquid water can exist on a distant planet or, or other body uh, in the universe, it needs to be the correct distance from its sun, from its star. Um, and it's also helpful to have an atmosphere. Our atmosphere holds heat, it traps heat, and this keeps water on the surface of the earth from freezing. If we didn't have an atmosphere, the temperature on our planet would actually be too cold for water to remain a liquid, it would all freeze. But we also don't wanna be so close to the sun that uh, the water on the surface of the planet just boils and turns to steam. So, the Earth in our solar system is the only planet that has a constant uh, body of liquid water on the surface. Venus is closer to the sun and it has a very, very thick atmosphere, so it's too hot for liquid water to exist. The water is all water vapor and exists as clouds. Um, on Mars, all of the water is in ice caps and is frozen. 
Um, Mars is further from the, from the sun and also has a much thinner atmosphere. And so it can't hold heat effectively. And so most of the water on Mars is frozen, although there may be occasional little trickles of liquid water from time to time when the temperature allows. However, there are moons in our solar system that have liquid water constantly. So this, for example, is Europa. Europa is one of the moons of Jupiter. Jupiter has 80 moons. We only have one. Jupiter has 80. And Europa is one of them. It's, in fact, one of the first moons of Jupiter that was discovered. It was discovered by Galileo. Um, so this is what the surface of Europa looks like. It's a big crust of ice. And those red marks that you can see are places where the water is very heavily enriched in minerals. Ganymede is another moon of Jupiter that is also covered in ice. It has this big ice crust around it. And Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn, is also um, a body in our solar system that has water. It is also covered in ice. All of these bodies are very, very far from our sun. Jupiter is further from our sun than we are. And so the surface of these moons are covered in ice, but underneath this ice, we suspect there is a deep liquid ocean of water, much like our own. In fact, the volume of water on these moons is actually greater than the volume of water on our own earth because they're mostly ocean. But they are very far from the sun. And so life doesn't just need water. Life also needs energy. And on Earth, our greatest source of energy is the sun. Sunlight is used by plants and photosynthetic bacteria and algae to make food, and they form the base of the food web. How do you replicate that? Where do you get a, a source of energy as great as the sun when you are that far away from the sun that the water on the surface of your, your celestial body, your moon in this case, is completely frozen. Um, well, it turns out light is not the only possible source of energy for life. Uh, on our own planet, we have places where life exists without light. Instead of using the energy from sunlight, it uses chemical energy. So one of the types of places are black smokers. These are hydrothermal vents that were discovered in the 1970s. The hydrothermal vent is a place where water interacts with rock and um, is ejected from the ocean crust and forms this kind of volcanic structure. So black smokers form where two plates of ocean crust meet. And basically what happens is ocean water travels underneath the ocean crust, and becomes very, very heated. And when it escapes, um, the water is very high temperature, up to 400 degrees Celsius. That's four times the temperature that it takes to boil water. But the water here doesn't boil because the pressure is so high. It cannot turn to steam. So it just remains this very, very superheated liquid. It's also very acidic. The pH is about two, which is similar to vinegar. Um, it's loaded with minerals that result in this black color, particularly sulfides. And when these minerals contact the cold seawater, they form these characteristic chimneys. So this seems like a pretty harsh location for life to exist. It's very hot, it's very acidic. There's all these chemicals in the water and yet they're teeming with life. Uh, we can see these tube worms, little shrimps, mussels and clams and crabs, and even nurseries for baby octopi, which we see in the middle here. And so the chemical energy supplied by these hydrothermal vents supports an incredibly diverse ecosystem, uh, a whole world with no light, which is just absolutely fascinating. In addition to these black smokers, there's another type of hydrothermal vent. These are called white smokers. And as you can see, they look very, very different from black smokers. And they have very different characteristics. They're usually further off axis, meaning further away from the boundary between two plates. And white smokers form where water reacts with certain types of minerals in the ocean crust. When this happens, the water becomes warmer, uh, but it's not quite boiling. Um, instead of having an acidic pH, we have an alkaline pH. So it's more like baking soda or household bleach. Still not exactly uh, nice for most living things, but 
there are things that can live here. Uh, barium, calcium, and silica in the water cause the white color of the chimneys. And the calcium reacts with carbonates in the seawater and makes these huge chimneys that are between 30 and 60 meters tall. So very different types of conditions here. So this reaction uh, between water and rock is called serpentinization. And it's a metamorphic process. It's a process by which rock changes from one type to another type. So in this case, we go from this beautiful green mineral olivine that's found in ocean crust, it reacts with water and carbon, and it forms this other mineral, this black mineral called serpentine. This reaction results in a very high pH, this alkaline pH we talked about, but it also produces molecules that microbes can use as a source of energy or as a source of food. So um, these small organic molecules that microbes can use. And so these hydrothermal vents are also teeming with life. It's a very different looking life system from the kind we see around black smokers. Uh, but we see these coatings of microbes on the insides and the outsides of these vents that are harnessing this energy and using these chemicals as a food source. And so even though light does not reach this far down at the bottom of the ocean, there is enough energy here from these chemical reactions to support a living system. What's really fascinating about this particular type of reaction is that we don't have to go to the bottom of the ocean to see it. So there are places on continents where ocean crust has been lifted up by geological activity and placed on the land. And one of those places uh, is uh, a place where I've done research before. It's in California. It's called the Coast Range Ophiolite Microbial Observatory. And this is a place where a huge chunk of ocean crust was lifted up and emplaced on the continent, uh, I think sometime in the Jurassic period, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a place where we can observe this reaction between water and ocean crust without having to go all the way to the bottom of the ocean. We drill into the rock and tap into this ancient ocean that's trapped within this continental crust. Another place where we can observe this is in the Sultanate of Oman, which is um, south of Saudi Arabia and east of Yemen. Um, and so this ophiolite is called the Samail ophiolite. It's the largest ophiolite um, in the world and the best characterized. So an ophiolite is what we call a piece of ocean crust that's been lifted up and placed on the continent like this. Um, and so what you're looking at is a vast desert with an ancient ocean trapped underneath of it. And on the tops of some of these mountains, you can actually see ancient coral reefs that were brought up with this piece of ocean crust when it was emplaced on the land. And so these are places where we can study this interaction between water and rock without having to go all the way to the bottom of the ocean, which can be very difficult and very challenging. Um, and interestingly enough, we also see this type of reaction potentially in the subsurface of Mars. And so Martian rock may also uh, undergo this serpentinization reaction between water and rock that produces energy and um, organic molecules that microbial life might be able to harness. And so by studying these ophiolites on our own planet, we may be able to understand this process on distant worlds. And so my laboratory, um, we do a lot of different things, um, but uh, in terms of our astrobiological interests, we're really interested in understanding these interactions between rock and water um, at hydrothermal vents and in serpentinization that help support life so that we can understand how these same reactions might support life on other worlds. Uh, and so here is my Twitter and my website if you're interested in checking those out. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you have about my research. I'll just stop sharing here. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That was uh, a wonderful presentation. And I learned a lot about uh, what all is being done and how far we have come when it, when it comes to finding life and searching for water and the places to. Um, I'm sure our students must have also enjoyed and they already have some uh, questions which have started coming. So the first question is by um, Basil. 
and he's uh, particularly more interested into possibility of life on Jupiter itself, um, not on the moons. Um, so what do you uh, think about that? So um, that's certainly a possibility. I remember seeing something from, I want to say Carl Sagan um, had this idea about how life might exist on the planet Jupiter. Um, so Jupiter is a gas giant. Uh, so a living thing uh, on a gas giant would have to be buoyant in some way. It would basically have to exist suspended in the gas. Um, and so he was envisioning like living things that were um, not necessarily like flying, but just sort of like drifting along within this um, gas on the planet, um, which I think is just a fascinating concept. And it's something that we thought about for Venus too. I mentioned that uh, the surface of Venus is way too hot for water to exist as a liquid, and the pressure is really, really high. But it's possible that life could exist in the atmosphere of Venus, where the temperature is a lot more um, amenable to life. It's a lot less harsh. And so it's interesting to envision um, a living thing that exists kind of suspended in, in the atmosphere or suspended in, in gas rather than, um, you know, in liquid or on a solid surface, the way we usually think of life. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yes. And uh, the next question was about Venus uh, itself. So uh, what kind of life? Oh, I'm sorry. I, you cut out for just a second. So what kind of life could exist on Venus, I think was the yeah. question. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, so Venus, um, you would have to have a uh, life suspended in the atmosphere um, where the temperature is not quite so high. Um, the atmosphere of Venus has these clouds of sulfuric acid, which is also very, very harsh. But if you get high up enough in the atmosphere, you can get like sort of above that. Um, like when you're flying in a plane and you get up above the clouds and suddenly like the sky is blue and it's sunny. So uh, if you could get up above those clouds of sulfuric acid and have some sort of living thing suspended up in the atmosphere up there, it could, there could potentially be um, a, a, a living system up there. And we we may have discovered phosphine on Venus, which is considered to be a potential biosignature um, I think there's still some contention about that signature, that signal as to whether it's real. Just getting to the right point where it's not quite so harsh. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have one more question, and this is by our student Sirat. And they're asking, uh, what about mermaids? Like, is there any possibility? Do they exist? mermaids oh my goodness I mean I hope so <laughs> I feel like I'm a mermaid at heart I had a student ask me that same question about work a college student actually was asking about mermaids and I said well I'm proof that mermaids are real because I'm a mermaid um but I mean who knows like there are just so many possibilities out there right and whenever we go into the ocean, I mean, our own ocean, there's 95% of it that we haven't explored. It's so vast. And we're constantly discovering new things. We have found animals that we thought were extinct that are still alive and, and thriving. And you just never know what you're going to find. So yeah, maybe one day you'll be the one to discover mermaids. <laughs> Yes, I hope, uh, Sirat, that answers your question. And uh, Bhavya is asking, like, how do we uh, test the sand or the water to find the evidence of the alien life? What are the procedures? Uh, what That's a it? great question. Wow. So there are so many different ways to think about this. When you're looking for life, how do you know that you found life, especially if it's something that's vastly different from life on our own planet, right? Um, so what we tend to look for are things called biosignatures. So a biosignature is like a sign that life is there. It's something that only a living thing could produce. Um, so these would be things like 
you know, certain types of compounds, certain types of things that only a living organism makes, um, or you look for processes. So, um, you know, there are a lot of reactions that occur between rocks and water, like the ones we just talked about, that produce things that living cells also make. But living cells tend to do things faster than geology does. So if you see something being made at a really fast rate or in a really large amount, you might say, well, that's probably being made by a living thing and not just by rocks and water and air chemically reacting the way that they do. And so, for example, uh, looking for life on Mars, uh, you know, we're looking for things like methane gas. Methane gas is something that can be made by microorganisms. And it's something that can be made geologically too, but there are ways to test the methane to see if it's being made by a living thing versus being released by rocks in some geologic process. Um, we could also look for things like proteins or DNA or, um, you know, lipids fats, the things that are made by a living cell, because the chance of these being randomly made by some geologic reaction are very, very low. The problem with that is that we're making the assumption that living things everywhere make the same types of stuff. They make the same kinds of molecules and they have the same kinds of cells. And the fact is, we don't know. Maybe a living thing on another planet will have a totally different structure. Um, so it's a really difficult question. Um, it's something that we, that we as scientists talk about a lot. Like, what do we look for and how do we know that we found life when we see it? Um, so, yeah, that's something that we, we argue about a lot, actually, <laughs> in a friendly yes. way. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's uh, one more question. And uh, this is regarding, like, are there any missions which are being planned to um, these uh, icy moons? Um, so yeah. if you can talk about that. Yes, so we are planning uh, what's called the Europa Clipper mission, which is going to be a flyby. So um, basically what that means is that you send out a, a spacecraft and it flies by the planet and takes data from space. Um, so most of the data that we have about Europa right now is from the Cassini mission, which was uh, flying uh, to Saturn. And so, um, that mission got a lot of data about Europa just by flying past it. There are these plumes of seawater that are ejected from the surface. And if you fly through the plume, you can measure the chemical composition of the water as you pass by. Uh, and so Europa Clipper is being planned. I can't remember, I think it's launching in another couple of years. Um, but the, the plan for Europa Clipper is to fly around Europa and get more data about these plumes. There is also a lander mission that's been talked about. I think it's currently on hold, but it would basically be a rover we have on Mars, except, and this is really cool, the rover on Mars is basically like a little ATV. It rolls around on wheels uh, taking samples. The lander on Europa would be a gyrocopter. So it would fly around uh, the surface of the planet, land on a spot, or the surface of the moon, rather, land at a spot, take a sample, and then lift up and fly somewhere else and take another sample. And so um, I was in a talk that was describing the, that mission, and it looks really, really cool. But they, they put it on hold because of budget concerns. It is in the works. Um, so yeah, Europa is kind of like the big focus right now in terms of getting more data about these icy moons. But there's a lot of talk about Enceladus too. Enceladus is a really good contender for finding life for lots of different reasons. And so hopefully they'll plan a, a direct admission to that one as well. Yes. And uh, the helicopter kind of mission uh, sounds very cool. Like it's, it's going, it's flying, it's landing. It's very yeah. spectacular. If, it would be uh, the first time that we have like a flying uh machine on another world basically so it would be a huge first yeah <laughs> yes um and uh, one of the student is asking uh why is uh, why did pangea split into pieces that's a good question so pangea so 
for, for everyone who doesn't know, Pangaea was a supercontinent. So all the continents on the surface of the earth were once one big continent. And actually this happened a couple of times. So the, the plates that make up the crust of the earth are constantly moving and shifting around all of the time. Sometimes they come together uh, and sometimes they split apart. So the last time they smashed together, it formed the Himalayan mountains, for example. They pushed together and kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing until all the land uplifted and formed a mountain range. All, that's generally how mountain ranges are formed. Um, and then sometimes they split apart and an ocean is formed in the center. At these spreading centers, like at the center of the Atlantic Ocean, we find a lot of these uh, black smokers. Um, and so Pangaea split apart because the plates just kept moving. They're constantly moving. They're actually sort of floating on top of um, not a completely liquid, but the layer just below the ocean or the, the ocean crust and the land crust, the crust of the earth, the layer just below that is like kind of liquid, kind of solid, the mantle of the earth. Um, and so because that flows, the plates are flowing on top of it. It's just very, very slow. So we would never, you know, notice the movement in our lifetime unless we were like dedicatedly trying to measure it. It's something like a centimeter a year or something like that. Um, so yeah, eventually all the continents could come back together again and make one big continent. It just takes a really, really long time. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> one of the question by our student Bhavya is, uh, why do fishes deep in oceans have some kind of light uh, in their body? Like jellyfishes also have some light. That's a good question. Yeah. So there are some animals that um, have what we call bioluminescence. So they form uh, light in their bodies. Um, and this can be for a couple of different reasons. I mean, it can be to help them see, it can be to help them hunt. Um, Angler fish use light to trick their prey. So they have a little light that hangs off the front of their head. Um, and other fish are attracted to it, kind of like the way insects are attracted to a light and they all fly around it. Um, so they trick other fish into being attracted to this light, like, hey, what is that over there? And then gobble up the little fish that they've tricked with this light. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different reasons. It could be to help evade being eaten. Um, there's... Uh, cuttlefish that use light to trick predators into thinking that the light coming from them is just the moon being reflected through the water. And then there's ones that use it for hunting and for looking around. Um, there are coral that bioluminesce and we don't know why, like why do coral need to be bright? We don't know, but they form all kinds of bright fluorescent colors. Um, and so, yeah, bioluminescence is a really fascinating topic. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, one other question is, uh, why is seawater or beach water um, salty and saline? That's a really good question too. So seawater is salty because, basically because um, it gets all of these different salts uh, from the rocks um, from, from the earth. And so, you know, salts and different types of things come into the ocean that way. And um, they do eventually leave, but the rate that they leave the water is slower than the rate that they come in. So seawater is salty because it's getting all of these different um, mineral salts from the rocks and they're being removed at a much slower rate than they come in. So um, it stays salty. Um, and there are parts of the ocean that are saltier than others. So uh, deep water tends to be saltier than um, the surface water because the surface water receives rainfall. And so it tends to be more fresh. Um, and also salty water is denser, so it sinks to the bottom. Um, the Atlantic Ocean is saltier than the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is fresher for some reason. Um, so yeah, it's, there's like, there's people who just study the composition of, of the ocean, chemical oceanographers, and they just study the chemical reactions of the, of the ocean and, and the salt in it. And 
it's really fascinating. We tend to think of the ocean as being like super salty, but it's really only about like three and a half percent salt. And interesting fact, all of the salts in ocean water, the composition is the same as the composition of your blood and the water in your cells. It's just more concentrated. Um, so you have all of the same salts and things in your own body, um, what Jacques Cousteau called like the oceans in his cells. Um, but it's just not as concentrated as the ocean. So the ocean is just the same stuff, but saltier. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, what one of the students is asking, uh, you said that only some percentage of the water is uh, discovered. So what about the rest of the uh, water? Can the submarine go down there? Uh, I'll have to think which exact part of the presentation was this uh, part of. Yeah, yeah I mentioned that oh, maybe like only 5% of the ocean has actually been explored. Um, and yeah, I mean, we all, all of us, all of, all of us, you know, people who are oceanographers who are interested in marine life want to explore as much as possible. Um, so there's a couple of different things that make that tough. Uh, for one, um, it costs a lot of money to take a, a research vessel out and explore the ocean. They're very, very expensive to run day to day between, you know, the fuel and feeding everybody and, you know, paying everybody to get out there and do this work. And the ocean's really, really big and there's a lot of it to see. Um, and the other thing is that there are parts of it that are so deep that we don't have vessels that can get that far down, uh, particularly ones that can have a person inside. The pressure underneath the ocean is extremely high. And the deeper you go, the more pressure there is. And so whenever you want to explore anything below that top layer of the ocean, you have to build something that can withstand all of that pressure without being crushed and without crushing the people inside of it. Um, and so that is an engineering challenge and we're constantly getting better at, at building um, submersibles. And um, we also have robots that we can send down there. So you don't have to send a person, you can just send a robot with a camera to look around that can withstand that pressure, but they can only look at so much for so long. Um, and so we're getting better and better at it. Um, there are actually projects to incorporate commercial vessels into ocean exploration as well, because ships are constantly sailing all over the globe. Um, and there's no reason why they can't also collect data for us so that we can understand the ocean better. And so um, there are some projects to incorporate those ships and even, um, you know, people's private sailboats and yachts and things like that, you know, people who go out on the ocean for fun, they can also collect data for us. And so we're more and more incorporating citizen scientists into this because there's just so much ocean and we can't look at it all at once. Yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> there's way too much ocean. Um, and there's uh, one, one uh, I think, question or point raised by a student, Basil, was asking that uh, beach water is uh, salty, but we don't float in the beach water um, like the dead ocean. Um, mm. so why is that? No, so the Dead Sea is much saltier than the ocean. I can't remember the exact percentage off the top of my head, but um, the reason why it has to do with like water evaporating out of the Dead Sea and not being replaced as fast. And so it's just more concentrated. It's like if you boiled something and you released a lot of the water inside and you concentrated it down, that's kind of like what's going on with the Dead Sea. And so it's salty enough that you can just sit on the water and float. The fact that the ocean is salty does help uh, really large vessels float on it. Um, but it's not as salty as say the Dead Sea. I think that we project that eventually the Mediterranean will become that salty because it's also kind of closed off um, in that way. And that Strait of Gibral Gibraltar that leads out into the Atlantic Ocean is so narrow that one day it'll eventually close and the Mediterranean will evaporate and it'll get saltier and saltier until it just becomes a salt flat like millions of years in the future. Um, 
so yeah, it's, it's all got to do with the geography and um, the, how much water evaporates off of, off of the surface. Yes, um, and I think somewhat related to that is our next question by Nabhan, who's asking, why don't we have more drinking water on Earth? Why don't we have more drinking water? Like on Earth? Oh, yes. that's, that's an excellent question. I just watched a whole YouTube thing about this, actually. So we the Earth has a water cycle um, where all of our fresh water is uh, constantly replenished by rainfall. And so, um, you know, water evaporates into the sky and it makes clouds. And then those clouds rain and the water comes back down to the surface. Um, the vast majority, most of the water on earth is in the ocean. Something like 97% of the water is ocean water, which we can't drink. There are processes to remove the salt so that you can drink it, but they're very expensive. Um, and not super efficient. I mean, it supplies some of the drinking water to some parts of the world, but it is still a very expensive process. Um, so the issue with drinking water and, and fresh water availability is that uh, we are using it faster than the water cycle can replenish it. And because of global climate change, there are places where there have been droughts for many years. Here in the United States, for example, our West Coast has been experiencing a drought for some time. So California has been experiencing more wildfires because they don't get as much rain and everything is really, really dry. Um, the Colorado River provides water to, I think like seven states uh, in the West and feeds the Hoover Dam, which supplies hydroelectric power. And the level of the dam, the water has gone down steadily year after year after year because it's getting so dry. And eventually the dam won't function anymore because the water level will be too low to produce any electricity. Um, and so the use of water um, for things like agriculture and industry, um, I mean, it's daily use by people, but I think that the bigger the bigger picture is that companies uh, use a lot of water to for industrial processes, huge amounts, and we're just using more than can be replenished by rain, and we're also getting less rain because of global climate change. Um, and so, yeah, access to water is going to become a big issue in the coming years if we don't figure out a way to um, regulate our use of water so that the water cycle has a chance to replenish it so that it doesn't run out. Um, yeah. Definitely. Uh, a very good question, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the last question, I think the kids are very, very excited to learn more about the Dead Sea. So is there any particle that does not sink in the Dead Sea or what is the story behind the Dead Sea? Why do things float so much? Uh, yeah, it's, it's because of that high salt content. And um, yeah, there's a lot about it that I don't know. But I think the really fascinating thing about the Dead Sea in particular is that, um, you know, that much salt is really stressful for living things. Um, but there are certain organisms that have adapted to live in this really high salt content, the microbes in particular. Um, and so there are things that can still live there, even though it's very, very salty. Um, salt has a tendency to suck water out of living cells. Um, the water wants to go um, out of the cell. Uh, and so lots of things can't live in that amount of salt. Uh, in terms of things that won't sink. I mean, people go to the Dead Sea and just sit on the water and float. I mean, which I think is amazing. It's a place that I'd really love to go someday to check out. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's because the, the way that the, the sea is shaped, um, water evaporates out of, of the sea and it gets more and more concentrated with salt and the water isn't replenished that fast. And so it just gets more salty than the rest of the, the ocean and creates this really unique place. There's actually really high concentrations of salt at the bottom of the ocean too. Um, there are these brine pools, they call them, 
that exist at the bottom of the ocean, places where there's like this really, really intense pocket of salt water. And if you look at a picture of it, it almost looks like a lake under the ocean. The water is like that distinct from the rest of the ocean and only certain kinds of animals can live there and it's really really weird <laughs> yes yes uh so i think that was uh, most of the questions uh some questions are still remaining so i want to ask these students would they like to have dr lauren once again uh back at kalam labs maybe in one of the future events where she can share more about her works and maybe something more exciting so let us know in the comments if you would uh, like Dr. Lauren and uh, how did you like this session and today's event. And I want to thank Dr. Lauren so much for making time for us for coming in this event at such a short notice. Um, <laughs> it was uh, a pleasure to have you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was wonderful talking to all of you. <laughs> yes. Uh